Eddie Chavez. Ruben Nava. And Jesse Romero. Jesus 911. LASD, leaving all sin destroyed. What does CHP stand for? Oh, man. CHP stands Catholics for a lot of stuff. Catholic help, Catholics helping people, uh, everything. A lot of stuff. I'm Two reporting man car, for duty. 10 8, Soul Patrol, call letters John 316. Listen up. Roll call time. It's you men out there. Roll call. We're going to provide you some Catholic briefings, some Catholic intel, and give you, as uh, Sergeant Joe Friday says, just the facts, just the facts. And I hope all of you are reporting for duty, sir. Absolutely. Eddie, what do we got today? Jess, we got a we got a great topic. Uh, but first, before we go on, as there always usually is, uh, I just want to say uh, that Trump made a great speech last night. I mean, oh just, man, man, I heard that. I heard most of it, I should say. And uh, man, Jess, he just he's the most pro life president we had. You you can hear the sincerity in his voice when he talks about the sanctity of life. I just love to uh, I love to hear him speak about the sanctity of life issues. That's uh, it was great. It was really good. Very, yeah, very inspiring. I'm, I'm telling you, uh, I haven't heard a better uh, speaker in the office of the president as uh, Donald J. Trump. Yeah, and I, not only that, is uh, again, he just he's fired in all cylinders. Uh, anybody who's a cat, Orthodox Catholic is loving it. Yeah, Justin, I, it, it, all it did last night was reinforce for me why so many uh, uh, Catholics, practicing Catholics, are are Democrats, uh, regardless of what. What they're saying and throwing God out of the uh, the platform and, and the whole thing—it just amazes me, uh, and it just reinforces my uh, <clears throat> my support for the president. That's right. Uh, like the Bible says, pray for those in leadership and pray for those in authority, and uh, and, I, and we we should be praying for him every day. Absolutely, we do. Eddie, we do. there's a big debate in the Catholic Church. I'm not going to mention any names. Not any, you, people know who we're talking about. There's several people, but it actually comes from a theologian called von Balthasar. He wrote a book called "Dare We Hope That All Men Be Saved." It's put out by Ignatius Press. I had to read it for my master's, and uh, it was a terrible read. They, this guy was this theologian who's affected so many other theologians. Basically, argues that nobody's uh, probably nobody's in hell, and uh, that's what we want to talk about today. We want to see if there's anybody in hell. Specifically, we're going to focus in like a laser on one person <laughs> in the Bible. Judas is Judas in hell. And uh, before I jump into Scripture, let me just say that the word hell is mentioned 23 times in the New Testament alone. And Jesus Christ spoke of hell many times. And when Christ says he has the keys of hell in Romans 1.18, uh, the average person reading the clear teaching of Scripture it will understand that there are keys that Christ holds to a real place called hell. And if you ever need a perfect example of a Christian who lost his salvation, I think we could say Judas Iscariot would qualify. He would be it. He was the only disciple, and we're going to argue, you'll see, I think, uh, uh, when you're seeing what the evidence that we're going to mount, you're going to say, yep, yeah, the guy's in hell. Why? Because he died in unrepentant mortal sin. He betrayed Jesus, and he did not repent. So there are two things we can learn from Judas. One is uh, never love money. Uh, more than God, because look what money did to Judas. He was the treasure of the apostles. That's what his job, he was a treasure. And the second is, it's one thing to say you're a Christian with your mouth, but it's another thing to be truly a Christian and bear fruit. And uh, unfortunately, many people are going to become be, come before God on Judgment Day and be denied heaven because all they did was pay lip service to God in this lifetime, Eddie. Just one of the things I wanted to mention about the previous paragraph up here is... Uh, uh, the only way, uh, uh, the, the only disciple to go to hell because he died in unrepentant mortal sin. So let's talk about that really quick, Jess. Mm -hmm. So I think the trick here is uh, to obviously die in a state of grace. Amen. But if by chance, if by chance somebody is aware, uh, cognizant of, of, of serious sin, then I think what we have to do is uh, we have to be sorry for our sins even if we are, don't have the opportunity to make it uh, to confession before that. And I think that's an important distinction to make. Yeah, Jess. exactly. You can, you can be saved if, you have, if you're sorry for your sins. Let's say like you repent in your deathbed. There's no priest around. Nobody's around. 
you you make you you, have, you make a good act of contrition. In other words, you have contrition in your heart. Your heart is broken before God. It's crushed before God. Right. And you make some type of an act of contrition. It doesn't have to be the formal one that we know. It could be some of your own words in your mind. Lord, I'm sorry. I'm a, I'm a knucklehead. Man, I'm, you're right and I'm wrong and you're holy. And Lord, please forgive me. And as long as you make a perfect contrition, which means you're sorry out of love of God, not fear of hell, love of God, right. you can be saved. You put yourself in a state of grace. Even if there's not a priest there, nobody's there present, a person at the last moment of their life can put themselves in a state of grace by repenting and coming to perfect contrition. And just this is just to remind everybody that that we, you and I, and, and all of humanity are, are restricted by, by the sacraments. But God himself, the creator of the sacraments, is not restricted. So uh, yeah, that's uh, right on the catechism. A confession like that is 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 valid uh, for somebody's eternal soul. Uh, you might have to pay some time in. Uh, in the purgatory, but uh, say, yeah, I think work. most likely you would. Yeah, exactly. But you could pull a Saint. I mean, that's a kind of a Saint Dismas. You know what I'm saying? Well, but, but yes. Not, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. It's a last minute, uh, last ditch effort, but but sincere effort to. Yeah. Uh, it, there you go. That's the word. That's the key word. That's to be sincere effort. We call that perfect contrition. Exactly. Exactly. So let's oh. go. Let's mount some scripture and see what we can do about this Judas case here. Okay. So we're going to talk about. Uh, Acts 1, Acts chapter 1, verses 16 through 25 in the RSV. And this is what it says. It says, Brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit before, spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who was guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man uh, bought a field with the reward of his wickedness mm. and, fall, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out, and it was, be, and it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood, for it is written in the book of Psalms, "Let his uh, habitation become desolate, and let there be no one to live in it, and his office let another take." So. One of the men who uh, have accompanied us during all the, all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must uh, become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph and Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Lord, uh, Lord, who knowest the hearts of all men, show which one of these two thou hast chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. <laughs> go, I think that's the key word there. <laughs> I think so. I, I Judas think, turned aside to go to his own place. I don't think he went to some resort. You know, I don't think he went, uh, you know, to some... Uh, you know, five star uh, hotel or some penthouse. Exactly. Go to his own place. I think the, all the Bible verses we're going to mount are we're going to see that place that's referred to as hell. Exactly. Exactly. Let's look at the Dewey Reams here in Acts uh, 116 to 25. Uh, St. Peter, when he's talking about this, this go to your own place, he really borrows this from Psalm 108, verse 6 and 8. And uh, in the Dewey Reams, it says that when he said that uh, Judas, he said that Judas is. Bishopric must be replaced. Mm. He, he said, set thou the sinner over him and may the devil stand at his right hand when he is judged. May he go, may he go out condemned and may, this, and may his prayer be turned to sin. May his days be few and his bishopric let another take. So when you go to what Peter's quoting in, in what you just read, Eddie, He's quoting Psalm 108, verse 6 and 8. And in the Douay Reims, Eddie, it's very clear where he went. It indicates that he was damned. Yeah, just very I think. Very clear in the, the Douay Reims. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's why I love the Douay Reims. Just, and so let, let, let us be clear about this. So that uh, just as all the other apostles were, were succeeded by subsequent apostles or Correct. subsequent we call them bishops. bishops yeah. Uh, we can we can take from this passage that that the bishopric the office of Judas was never completed was never fulfilled so that he was not succeeded by anybody 
they replaced him, and then that apostle was was uh, later succeeded by uh, following apostles. Isn't that true? Yeah. It, it, even though Judas was a scoundrel, all the, the 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 office of apostle requires succession. That's why, as Catholics, we have a doctrine called apostolic succession. And even even if they're good or bad, I mean, the uh, uh, Macarica office it requires succession. Mahoney's office requires succession because we see it right from the New Testament. Even though uh, Judas was bad, his uh, his office required succession. Uh, it, it uh, you know, God willing, uh, they wouldn't they wouldn't act like him, but uh, that's a Catholic teaching that the, the office of the apostle, ergo the bishop, after that requires succession. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very good. Yeah. So uh, let's go on there. So uh, yeah. and Psalm one, Eddie, Psalm forty one verse nine. Yes. It says, look, very interesting. It says, even my close friend whom I trusted, he who shared meals with me has turned against me. So Psalm 41, verse 9, once again alludes to the betrayal of Judas. Yeah, absolutely. And this is, this is something that, uh, uh, that Christ is, is saying here, this, that, that, that one, of, one of the ones closest to him actually betrayed him. That's a huge fault, Jess, a huge fault. We're going to continue yeah, you with this. You can't betray Jesus and go to heaven. No, exactly. Right. Yeah. Okay, we're going to continue this topic when we come back. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus 911, we're talking about Judas. Did he go to hell? We'll be right back. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%! Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888 526 2151. Soul Patrol, two man car, 10 8. We're on duty. Topic is Did Judas go to hell? The, um, although there's not a Bible verse that says Judas is in hell, trust me, everything we're going to mount in today's show, you'll see, yep. <laughs> That's where he ended up at, based on scripture. 
Uh, Eddie, what other verse can we mount uh, to start building our case, as they say in a court of law? Well, here's here's another good one, just, just so people will remember. It was when Simon Peter answered and he said, Lord... What verse is that? What, what that's verse that's uh, John, John 6, 68 through 71. So so this is what Peter, uh, Simon Peter said, uh, answered. He says, Lord, to who will we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus replied to them, he said, didn't I choose you, the, the twelve? Yet one of you is the devil. Mm. He was referring to Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, one of the twelve, because he was going to betray him. This is very easy. I mean, yeah, this is not hard to figure out, Jesse. You don't that one's be, a clear one right there. You don't have to be a brain scientist to get this. I mean, uh, this is something. One of you is the devil. This is from the words of Jesus. Wow. Here's another one. <clears throat> we're, we're building a case here based on Scripture. Here's another one. Matthew chapter 20, verse 17 to 20. Okay? It says, As soon as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside privately and told them, what was going to happen to him. Listen, he said, we're going up to Jerusalem where the son of man will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachers of the religious law. They will sentence him to die. Then they will hand him over to the Romans to be mocked, flogged with a whip and crucified. But on the third day, he will be raised from the dead. Then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus and her sons. She knelt respectfully to ask a favor. So what do we see in this passage? Well, I think the key operative phrase here is, the Son of Man will be betrayed. Okay? Once again, uh, we saw that in the verse that Eddie just quoted. We saw that in the verse, uh, you know, in the verse uh, in Psalm 41, verse 9. The point that I'm making here is you can't betray God and die in that condition and go to heaven. Because to betray God, that would be a violation of the first commandment and a violation of the second commandment. So you can't live in that state of betrayal and go to heaven. Eddie, next. Yeah, just that's that's perfect reasoning there. So the next the next verse we're going to talk about is John 12, 2 through 6. And it says this, A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard, uh, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, That perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared. Now, this is not because he cared for the poor. He was a thief. And since he was in charge of the uh, disciples' money, Jess, he often stole some for himself. Wow, the Bible says that. Wow. Yeah. So, so here's a willing betrayal of Jesus. And the love of money here comes out, Jess. The love of money comes out here. Uh, he always used money. Judas always used money to calculate, to formulate the decisions that he made. Um, and, and so one has to think at some point he may have been unaware he was afflicted in this way, Jess. But as time went on, uh, he should have had an idea of what was going on. And certainly by the words of Christ uh, uh, describing him, uh, that should have been... Uh, Foremost in his mind. I think based on scripture, you can yeah. say that Judas loved money more than he loved God. Yeah. And Jesus has given us a clear teaching. He says, you cannot love God and mammon at the same time. Mammon, which was uh, his reference to, to money. So just we got to be careful when we buy lotto tickets because, you know, <laughs> can't love the money to that to that degree yeah. anyway. Yeah, it can supersede your love for God. Yeah, definitely. And that's, uh, that, that's, that's the point that he's making. Okay. Here's another verse mounting a case that Judas is in hell. Mark 14, verses 42 to 46. It says, let's be up, uh, yeah, up. This is Jesus speaking. Up, let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. Now, when if God, let me say this, here's my comment. If God calls you betrayer, that's not good, Eddie. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I want called to, I want God to call me his son, his child, not not betrayer. If he calls Faithful you betrayer servant. when he sees you, that's not a good sign that you're going to heaven. Okay, so exactly. All right, my betrayer is here, and immediately, even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of the twelve disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They had been sent by the leading priests, the, the teachers of religious law, and the elders. The traitor Judas had had given them a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. 
then you can take him away. Then you can take him him away under guard. As soon as they arrived, Judas walked up to Jesus. Rabbi exclaimed and gave him the kiss. Then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. So the point that I'm making here, I think we've already shown three or four passages back to back where Jesus calls him a betrayer. That's not a good sign when the only savior of the universe is calling you a betrayer. That's not indicative that you're in heaven. Just as, to me, this also shows that the betrayal, he had, he had thought about it. It was pre-planned. It was a premeditated betrayal, Jess. Very which, clear. Which is, the, which is the characteristics of mortal sin. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, uh, the next one. Well, let's, let's talk about Luke 22, verses 40 through 51. But Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those who were around him saw that he saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Once again, Jesus is calling him betrayer. That just, that's just not a good nickname. Uh, when the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world is walking around calling you betrayer every time he sees you, that's not a good nickname to have, Eddie. That's that's not indicative that you're walking in a state of grace. No, and you know, just I think, you know, and if you look beyond the different levels of Scripture here, I think we could see that that at this time in history, when Jesus knew what had to happen, he knew he had to suffer, he knew he had to pay, pay our price uh, because we couldn't pay it, um, He's actually stopping a revolt here because, you know, you, you could have had this human reaction just to what was going to happen. And you could have this human reaction when people started fighting. There could have been a whole chaos there in the garden. But Jesus, I think, was actually condemning individual intentions here by 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 reversing the effects, by by stopping it and healing, uh, healing the the uh, the service. Oh, without here. A doubt. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yep. Next verse, Matthew 24, 14 to 16. It says, then Judas Iscariot, one of the 12 disciples, went to the, to the leading priests, those are the Levites, not Catholics, and asked, how much will you pay me to betray Jesus to you? Uh, right there, that, another mortal sin clearly right there outlined in Scripture, okay? <laughs> how much will you pay me to betray Jesus to you? That's huge. And they gave him 30 pieces of silver. From that time on, Judas began looking for an opportunity to bet bet betray Jesus. Right there, that's a mortal sin right there. Full knowledge, deliberate consent, grave matter. And there's no indication in the New Testament that he ever repented of this action. Eddie? Yeah, just that's something that you have to keep in mind because there's a number. There's a number that, that Judas placed on, on, on even the Savior's life. Can you imagine that? He placed a value of 30 pieces of silver. Not not 29, but 30 pieces. That's uh, that's problematic. Uh, John 19, verse 11, Jesus answered, Would you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. And uh, this is a reference to, uh, to Judas and the Jerusalem, le Jerusalem leaders. Wow, when Jesus says that you're guilty of a greater sin, yeah. I don't know, Eddie, that sounds to me like a synonym for mortal sin. Yeah, that's, that's what it sounds to me, that Jesus Christ is saying, those who handed the those who handed me over to you are guilty of basically mortal sin. That's what greater sin means to me. Uh, but again, because again, because the Jews have gradations of sin like sins like we do. Right, right. Sins have yeah. Sins have uh, Jews have sins that warrant death, and uh, Jews have sins that just warrant a small penance, like you know, a, a small animal sacrifice in the temple. Let's move on over now to. How did Judas die? Okay. <clears throat> the fifth commandment says, thou shall not kill. And the Catholic Church says that even re references, that even refers to you. You can't kill yourself. That would fall under the fifth commandment. Okay. Matthew 27, two to six, the Bible says, and they bound him and led, led him away. This is Jesus and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and the elders saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. 
But the chief priest taking the pieces of silver said, it's not lawful to put them into the treasury since it is blood money. Now, Judas could have saved himself. If Judas would have had this like King David, oh, I have sinned, Lord, I'm sorry. And he composed Psalm 51. But, but David went to do what's called um, restitution, or we call penance, or we call reparation for your sins. And, and when somebody does that, that means that they have hope in God. They have hope in his promises that God can forgive them. But, or you can do the opposite. You can go into despair. Despair is a sin against God. It's a sin against the first commandment. And Judas fell into the sin of despair. He could not believe that God could ever forgive him of such a sin, a weighty sin that he committed. And so he went and hung himself. That's a violation of the fifth commandment. If you do that with full knowledge and deliberate consent to the will, that's a mortal sin. And once again, uh, it was that's not an act of hope. That's an act of despair. And just we get a glimpse of that with that verse where he says, uh, uh, you know, uh, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. So at that point, he realizes what he did. Uh, he gets into that state of despair. And I, I think that he may have been planning already what to do because they... Um, uh, they throw the money back down. They, they didn't, uh, you know, they didn't accept it. And they certainly didn't put it back into the treasury because it's blood money. Um, so I think that's, uh, uh, then they said he he hung himself. So I think that's that's a, a, a perfect way to describe what happened to Judas. Eddie, the- and I think the reason he fell into despair, my opinion, I think we could back it up from scripture. I think he was demonically possessed. There you go. Yeah, watch. That's, that's, uh, yeah, let's yeah, keep going and figure that yeah, out. Go ahead, share, share the next verse that we want to mount. Yeah. Okay. Uh, John 13, John 13, verses 24 through 27. Simon Simon Peter got this follower to look his way. He wanted him to ask Jesus which one he was speaking of. While close beside Jesus, he asked, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is the one I give this piece of bread to after I have put it in the dish. Then he put the bread in the dish and gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. After Judas had eaten the piece of bread, Satan went into him. Jesus said to Judas, what are you going to do? What, what, what you are going to do, do in a hurry. We'll talk about that verse when we come back. Yeah, I think he was possessed. I think we could back it up. Yep, there we go. We'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus 911, we'll be right back. Don't change that dial.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show, and they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Soul Patrol 10-8, reporting for duty, sir. We're on duty. Eddie, we're talking about, uh, is there anybody in hell, and I believe that we're mounting a very good case in the court of law that indicates that Judas went to hell. In fact, I think that the reason he hung himself is because he was demonically possessed. And the last verse that you just quoted in John 13, 24, it says that Satan went into him. You look at other Bible translations, it'll say Satan went into his heart. When Satan goes into your heart, that's not a good sign, Eddie. And right. I think St. Augustine comments on this verse. What does St. Augustine say? St. Augustine says he entered in order to possess more completely one who had already abandoned himself to him. Wow. To the devil. So, so this is something that... That uh, so let me ask you, Jess. So this is a good this is a good question, actually. Yeah. So is this the Eucharist? Is is Jesus doing this in the context of the Mass, or is this just a a meal that they shared? Uh, yeah. This was the meal. That, yeah. This is not the Last Supper. No. No. Okay. I. I okay. All yeah, right. Very good. Go. Yeah. So it was just the meal that they had. So yeah. so yeah. I mean, it was obvious though that that the result of that was that uh, that Jesus knew that he was going to betray him. He says, "Whatever you do, do it in a hurry." Yeah, so we have a call here uh, before we it. go on to the next one. Uh, I think it's John. Hello, John. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. How you doing, sir? I, I, I'm doing well. God bless you guys. I, I don't know if this will fit right in, but it's something that's been bothering me for a while. It's something that Saint, oh, Saint, um, Pope Francis said. He said that um, after a while or whatever, I don't know what at time, he said that the souls in in um, hell would be annihilated and uh, because that's more in keeping with the with the gospel and um, it, it really bothered me and I really kind of objected to it so I don't know if it fits into your discussion right now but I'd like to hear you guys address that or have you heard that he said that yeah I've, I've addressed it before I'll, I'll, I'll just say this I I'm, I'm almost positive without going back to some of the articles on that I believe he said that in an interview. Well, guess what, uh, my friend? Interviews are not magisterial teaching. The fact that he, it, that he okay. said that in an interview, on an off-the-cuff interview, uh, that's his opinion, but that doesn't comport to 2,000 years of Catholic teaching. We don't teach that the soul isn't... In fact, that you can't annihilate the soul. It's impossible because the soul is invisible. It has no parts. It's not composed of matter. The soul cannot mm. be annihilated. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of people that uh, have objected to that statement. Again, thanks be to God, it's not a magisterial statement. It was an opinion. Who knows? I don't know. Maybe he had a bad cup of coffee that day. Well, I don't know why he said that. Yeah, hey. But that but that's, it doesn't comport with, with Catholic teaching. We right. have a soul. The soul will either go to heaven for all eternity. The soul can't be annihilated. The soul can't be destroyed. It's pure spirit. And uh, the, or, or the soul will go to hell. Either one. There's the, no annihilation just, theory in Catholicism. It, 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 it just kind of amazed me. He said it. I I was just so blown away by it. So I figured that would be your. Uh, yeah, I'm just little, I'm just what, guessing. What I, I'm just guessing. Some one of his theologians may have told him that. One of the, the modernist theologians may have told him that, and it was just kind of a cool thing to say. In an and, interview, that's, but, and that's why he's vague when he, he answers those things. He's he gets uh, bad input, bad information, and. Uh, because I remember, I remember something about saying about the annihilation uh, of the soul. But uh, the reality is, uh, you know, uh, you cannot That's an impossibility. You can, you first of all, you cannot annihilate something that lasts forever. <laughs> that, that's right. And, and, okay, Rich. And, all right, Richard. Uh, there you go. Our, yeah. our engineer is jumping in. Rich, what did he say? Because I, 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 okay, I haven't fine. pulled the article. The, the disappearance. The disappearance. Okay. Disappearance the of the sinful soul. Yeah. Yeah. 
So that's what he says that will happen at uh, the end of time on Judgment Day, the disappearance of the sinful soul. Well, disappearance, you know, uh, the only way the soul is going to disappear, yeah, in mortal sin, it's going to be eternally separated from God, but it won't be <laughs> annihilated. It'll still exist. Yeah, it's going to disappear from God's presence. There will be an eternal separation, but no, it, it, it can't be annihilated. So, Rich, thanks for correcting us uh, and uh, looking up the article because it's been a long time since I've read that statement. So I was I, I don't want to put words in the Holy Father's mouth that he didn't say. Thanks, Rich. Hey, thanks, John. God bless you guys. All right, partner. Thank you. Take care. Yep. All right, Jess, where were we yeah, here? Let's move on. John 13, uh, verses 8 to, 8 to 11. Uh, it says, uh, no, Peter protested. You will never, ever wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter replied, then wash my hands and head as well. Lord, not just my feet. Jesus replied, a person who has bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. For Jesus knew who would betray him. That is what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. Well, guess what? When you stand before God, if you're in a state of grace, you'll be considered clean. If you stand before God in mortal sin, you're going to be, be considered unclean. So to me, John 13, verse 8 to 11, Jesus is alluding that the unclean person mentioned of here is Judas Iscariot. And that doesn't mean he, he, he got dirty underarms. It means he's in mortal sin. That's what it means. Yeah, Jess, I mean, we have to remember what the book of Revelation says. Nothing unclean shall enter into the into Amen. eternal eternity, so into paradise. That's talking about the soul. It's not e talking about your body. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so that was a good one for uh, a clear indication. There are several clear indications, Jess, that uh, Judas is in hell. Well, let's share them. And so let's keep going. Matthew uh, 26, verses 24 and 25 says this. For I must die just as was prophesied, but woe to the man by whom I am betrayed. Far better for that one if he had never been born. Judas too had asked him, Rabbi, am I the one? And Jesus had told him, yes. Wow. That That's, you know, <laughs> that one verse is all you need, I think, Jess. You know, th this is the thing. Uh, woe to the man to whom I am betrayed. Far better for that one if he had never been born. So I think we could address that's clear the, right there. Yeah, that's clear because the previous caller says, you know, the Pope said annihilation. It's not annihilation because Jesus is not inferring that. He's saying it would be better if somebody would never have been born. But 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 Judas, the one who betrayed me, is gonna suffer forever. I think that's you could you could extrapolate that from that verse. Yeah, uh, in other words. The the only thing that would make it better for you not to be born, or the only the only bit po more positive option, would be if you're comparing the person going to hell forever. In other words, yes. Jesus is saying it's here's what he's saying in a nutshell: it's better for you to never have been born than for you to be born and, and go, to, go hell to hell forever. Yeah, exactly. That, that's what he's saying. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to make it as simple as possible. Boy, it's that's better it. for you not to be born than to be born and then go to, and hell. Go to hell forever. That, that's what he's saying there. Yeah. That's Let's clear go to, evidence. Yeah. Go ahead, John. Go, go John to the 17, one. verse 11 to 12. Our Lord says, I will, rem will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. No, th this is very clear. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that the scripture would be fulfilled. If, if, okay, so nobody's been lost uh, the, uh, of, the, of the ones that you gave me, Father God. Jesus is saying, except the one doomed to destruction. If you look at uh, the Ignatius Study Bible put out by Scott Hans Institute, it says here, the son of perdition, Judas Iscariot, whose betrayal was foretold in passages such as Psalm 41, verse 9, uh, Psalm 69, verse 25, Acts 120. This is the person that Jesus is referring to right now in this passage. Yes, and I think this is a this is good uh, information to have because 
this tells us that the the remainder of the apostles didn't suffer what uh, what Judas suffered. This this is actually proof both ways. This proves that the eleven were clean and were martyrs and went to heaven, and uh, and uh, Judas was not. I think that that's a, a good uh, good information either way. Yep. Amen. Eddie, okay. so uh, here's a question, Jess. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Who who is the son of perdition? Okay, I'm going to go right to the new the the Catholic Encyclopedia. It's called NewAdvent.org. It answers it this way: the title "Son of Perdition" is used twice in the New Testament. First in John seventeen twelve, and again in Second Thessalonians two three. The phrase simply means "man doomed to destruction," and is not reserved for any one individual. In fact, there are two people to which the title. Son of perdition is applied. In context, John 17, 12, the verse I just read to you, is referring to Judas Iscariot. While 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 is referring to the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, who will appear in the end times before Christ's return. The word perdition means eternal damnation or utter destruction. It can also be used as a synonym for hell. When a person is called son of perdition, the connotation is that is that of a person in an unredeemable state, someone who is already damned while he is still alive. Jesus mentions the son of perdition in his high priestly prayer in John 17. While praying to the Father for his disciples, Jesus mentioned that he protected them and kept them safe and that none of them were lost except the son of perdition, that is, the one who was already in a damned state, or we call mortal sin. The fact that the phrase is used again to describe the Antichrist shows us that forgiveness was not planned for Judas. I'll say that again. This is a Catholic encyclopedia that forgiveness was not planned for Judas. Okay? God could have saved Judas, moved his heart to repentance, but he chose not to. He was indeed doomed to destruction. This is pretty clear, Eddie. This, yeah, Jess. I, I, I Han says the same this, thing. John 17, 11 and 12 says this is Judas, referring to Judas. And uh, same with the Catholic Encyclopedia. So, Jess, let's examine, let's examine, uh, well, when we come back from the break, let's examine Judas' uh, uh, free will here, okay? Because free will is still part of what he had. Let's discuss that when we come back. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Jesus 911. Uh, we'll be right back. Don't change that dial after these few short messages. Thank you.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show, and they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Back with Jesus 911, 1082-man call. We're talking about Judas Iscariot. Uh, Eddie, we're talking about a little bit about uh, Judas's free will. Judas had free will. All of us have free will all the way to the end. And what did Judas's free will choose? He chose to betray. despair. Exactly. Okay? Right. Your free will could choose hope. Man, I believe in God. Man, I'm going to change. I'm going to repent. I'm going to do penance and restitution. Or your free will could choose despair. Right. He chose despair. Yeah, just and, uh, and you know that's that's the same choice that millions and millions of people make worldwide every day yeah. to be in despair, to be in mortal sin, to remain in that state. That's the danger of what we're talking about here. It's possible for Judas, and it's possible for everybody else. Eddie, one thing interesting, every time the, the list of the apostles is mentioned in the New Testament, you'll find that Peter's always mentioned first, and Judas is always mentioned last. I mean, there's one list I have here, Luke chapter 6, verse 12 to 16, but all the lists of the apostles in the New Testament, you'll always find that order. Peter's mentioned first, and Judas is mentioned last. The Holy Spirit, who's the author of Scripture, uh, I don't think that's a coincidence that it's uh, that that it's numbered that way. Judas is always mentioned last. Let's go a little bit into private revelations here. One of the doctors of the church, St. Catherine of Siena, in her famous uh, dialogue, uh, God the Father actually spoke to her. This is a very famous book. It's called The Dialogue. And St. Catherine of Siena is one of the 36 doctors of the Catholic Church. And she was probably the, 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 the greatest exorcist back in the Middle Ages. In fact, the tradition of the church is that the hardest cases of demonically possessed people back in the Middle Ages that, uh, that the priest exorcists could not handle, they could not set free, they would take them to St. Catherine, and St. Catherine would set them free. Uh, she was known as the greatest, and she's, a, she's not even a nun. <laughs> she's a third order, order Dominican, I believe. She's a laywoman. But Amazing. here's what God the Father told her, and it's written in a book. It's called the book's called the dialogue. It says this quote. So the despair of Judas displeased me more and was a greater insult to my son than his betrayal had been. Therefore, such as these are reproved for this false judgment of considering their sin to be greater than my mercy, and for this they are punished with the demons and tortured eternally with them. Close quote. Notice again here that the sin of Judas betraying our Lord is not the one for which he's damned. But God the Father told St. Catherine, but it's his the, the despair of God's mercy. Uh, this is why Judas was damned, according to God the Father, in his uh, locutions to St. Catherine of Siena. Just because, yeah, Go yeah ahead, you know, you and I have seen this kind of despair, Jess. We've seen, especially the mothers of 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 those people that have been uh, aff afflicted with with uh, deliverance, in, in, in need of deliverance, etc. Maybe even sometimes exorcism, and and we've seen the despair that comes into a family, and 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 to say that there's no way to overcome that is wrong because you and I have both seen mothers just just adamant praying. Catholic mothers that have prayed their 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 loved ones, either sons or daughters, out of this uh, possessed state. So this is something that's that's I I, I get this because uh, despair shuts you off to all the other uh, uh, graces, things, all the other graces that can can lift you up. And uh, and so I understand how this uh, how this happens. Here's another doctor of the church. Uh, again, there's only 36 doctors of the Catholic Church in heaven. And a doctor of the church doesn't mean you got your PhD from liberal Notre Dame or, or Catholic U. That's not what a doctor of the church is. It has nothing to do with a PhD. 
These are these are the some of the greatest minds that ever walked planet Earth. They were holy. They were in tune with God. Their prayer life was uh, laser focused. They lived in a state of grace, and their their understanding of God in the interior life broke the glass ceiling. That's what we call them, doctors of the church. Saint John of Avila, another doctor of the church. He was a Spanish priest and mystic. Here's what he writes. I'll just quote the pithy section. He says this. So the devil acted with Judas when he was at the point of committing his sin. The devil removed its gravity of his crime in having sold his master at so low a price and unto such a death. Thus, the devil blinded his eyes with the greatness of his sin and having caught him in the snare, led him to hell. St. John of Avila, doctor of the church. I don't know about you, Eddie, but I'm not about to argue with these doctors of the church. No, you know what, Jess? They, uh, they have certain graces that others we, don't, that have. We don't have. And, and That's what they're called, doctors of the church. Exactly, and, and the reality is you, we have to listen to them, not, not with the same, the same uh, preciseness as Scripture, but right, let me tell you right. something. When you have a personal conversation with the Lord, uh, you know, there's something you have to pay. You have to open your ears to that, definitely. And not only that, when 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 some of the when saints get when these thirty six saints got the title doctor of the church, it's because Eddie their doctrine was absolutely Catholic. You know they're not they're not teaching modernism. They're not teaching heresy. No deviations. You know, no deviations from the Catholic <laughs> yeah, Church. Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, now here's another biggie. Okay, this is another piece of evidence. I would say it comes from tradition. In the actual prayer of exorcism, that's prayed by a Catholic priest with permission of the bishop, is called the rite of exorcism. In part two, that's where the prayer starts, part two and part three. Look at the one sentence that's part of a long, long prayer that the priest prays over the possessed, okay? I think it, you could kind of make the case here that, again, that the rite alludes to the fact that Judas is in hell. It says this, okay? As the priest is praying over the possessed, trying to pound the demon with prayer to drive him out. The priest says this, yield to God, as he's speaking to the demon. Then the priest makes a sign of the cross. He says, who condemned you in the person of Judas Iscariot, the traitor, for he now flails you with his divine scourges, makes a sign of the cross. He in whose sight you and your legions once cried out. Stop right there. That one sentence, Eddie, the, the priest is driving out the devil and he's telling the devil or a demon or demons that God who condemned you, devil or demons, in the person of Judas Iscariot, the traitor. So in the prayer, the rite of exorcism, the priest is telling the demons, you know, as he's trying to drive them out of the person's body, God is condemning you in the person of Judas Iscariot, which indicates to me that God condemned Judas Iscariot. I mean, that's the way I read that. No, I don't think there's another way to read that, Jess. I mean, that's exactly what it says. And, and uh, you know, this is, this is so beautiful, Jess, this, this type of prayer, especially when, when it talks about, about Judas Iscariot. So he, whatever, whatever age this particular rite of, of exorcism is, is, is occurring, it's linking it back to the original betrayer. That, that's huge right there in, in, the, in the 16, uh, 14 rite that uh, you're quoting there. And here's the, the last one that I would just mount as a defense. Well, notice what we've done so far. Eddie, we gave the first half of the show, we gave all scripture to kind of make our case. And the second half of the show, we're giving tradition with a capital T. We're quoting doctors of the church, official Catholic prayers. Now, here's something from the Council of Trent which with, that it says about Judas in two separate instances. Here's what it says, quote, Such certainly was the condition of Judas, who repenting hanged himself and thus lost soul and body, close quote. And it says, but also end in this, that they derive no other fruit, uh, that they, that they derive no other fruit from their priesthood, than was derived by Judas from the apostleship, which only brought him everlasting destruction. And here, the Council of Trent is talking about uh, misleading priests and bishops. And in the liturgy for Holy Thursday, from the old rite, 
the prayer for the, the Mass reads this. O God, from whom Judas received the punishment of his guilt and the thief received the reward of his confession, grant us the effect of your clemency. So these two old, okay, one of the top thing that I quoted is from the Council of Trent. And then the, the last thing I quoted was from the Holy Thursday, the, the old rite oh, right. under the Latin Mass. To me, as you read these prayers, it doesn't sound like we have a reasonable hope that all men are saved, at least not Judas. It also sounds like a good number of the ordained in the Council of Trent, because it's talking about bad bishops and priests in right. that one sentence. They end up damned for spreading error and false teaching and confusion. Eddie? Yeah, just, I mean, I heard somebody say that the uh, road to hell is paved with the skulls of bishops. This is... This is something that 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 is in the at, teachings. St. John Chrysostom actually said that another doctor of the church. There you go. And and so and and the reality, Jess, is that that we have to pay attention to this to the doctors of the church because they in, in themselves have the reality of everything that's taught. And so that's that's a, a a very very important thing to remember. These these prayers, the Council of Trent, um, and 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 the Holy Thursday, uh, the old rite. Which we don't hear anymore, but uh, but we should. Uh, Eddie, you know what? I want to just give people some hope. Yeah, exactly, because this is very difficult to deal. Yeah, with. let's let's uh, let's uh, say the Jesus prayer that ba- that that Saint John Chrysostom taught us. Just repeat after me: Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus. Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Let's say it again two more times: Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And this last one, even pound your chest. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Catholics, say that prayer throughout the day. That's called the Jesus Prayer. It was written by St. John Chrysostom back in the 4th century. It's a, it's a quick act of contrition. If you say it from your heart, and with perfect contrition, you could actually put yourself in a state of grace. But say that prayer throughout the day so that you don't fall into the sin of despair and we, we can all make it to heaven. Eddie, wrap it up, Eddie. Yeah, Jess, you know what? We have to remember that. We have to remember that that we have we're responsible to pull ourselves out of these despairs. You know, life, I'd like to say, is our peaks and valleys. Peaks and valleys in this life. We have to understand that. And the only one really that can pull us out of of, of a valley uh is is ourselves. And so we pray that prayer. We we remember that we ourselves are sinners, that we have to uh, uh account for the things that we do wrong, but Thanks be to Almighty God. We have a forgiving Father that wants to forgive us, that brings us into the sacrament of reconciliation, and therefore we are able to do that through His grace. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for joining us today with uh, Jesus 911. Uh, We will be back tomorrow, and uh, until then, God bless you, and St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Battle. God bless you. Faustina's Prayer for Priests. O my Jesus, I beg thee on behalf of the whole Church, grant it love and the light of thy Spirit, and give power to the words of priests, so that hardened hearts might be brought to repentance and return to thee, O Lord. Lord, give us holy priests. Thou thyself maintain them in holiness. O divine and great High Priest, May the power of thy mercy accompany them everywhere and protect them from the devil's traps and snares, which are continually being set for the souls of priests. May the power of thy mercy, O Lord, shatter and bring to naught all that might tarnish the sanctity of priests. For thou canst do all things. Amen. Virgin Most Powerful, pray for us.